Welcome to CXWise, where we share wisdom, insights, stories, and expertise from the world of customer experience. I'm your host, Nathan Bennett, and you're about to hear real-world experiences and practical advice that will elevate your CX game no matter your title and no matter your industry. So without further ado, let's get wise. My guest today is Sally Mildren. She's a human-centered healthcare strategist and customer experience leader. Sally is the CEO and managing partner of Boss Lady Consulting and Clarity PX. With over 20 years of experience, she's worked as an executive leader in marketing, engagement, and customer experience for various healthcare systems and insurers. Sally's journey has brought her full circle from beginning as a therapist to becoming an entrepreneur, a wife, a mother, and a healthcare marketing and culture leader. We are so thrilled to have you. Welcome to CXY's Sally Mildren. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So one of the first things I want to do with our guests is level set what we're actually talking about so we're all dealing with the same terms. So I guess my first question is, how would you, Sally Mildren, define customer experience? I think customer experience is, in the end, the collective whole of experience with your organization or business. So that could be from website to a phone call to the mail, whatever. And so that experience is woven through every single facet of your business. And is there a differentiation between customer experience and patient experience, at least in the application of that, how a healthcare provider might see that? You know, there are nuances between them. Some people don't want to call patients customers. Some leaders in experience believe that it's important to think about them as a customer because ultimately the consumer and the individual receiving the care or participating in whatever health service we're providing is comparing you to the customer experience of their cell phone, of their bank, of Amazon, of their retail providers. And so the nuance obviously is in the context of health and there's a lot more opportunity for some of the most vulnerable times of someone's life are involved here. So there's more stakes personally than maybe buying a new pair of shoes. But right. I think the pr underlying principles of putting the human at the center of your operational and service goals apply to every industry everywhere. Hmm. What specifically piqued your interest about focusing with Clarity PX on the patient experience? What were those things that you saw when you were in healthcare, um, either as a patient yourself or as someone who was working in that industry that you thought these are huge opportunities and I know I can impact these in this way? Right. I think the thing that I really learned in my career that is now completely the focus of Clarity PX is that you can't fix experience without also taking a look at your culture and your brand. And that is the kind of magic space that I discovered in my professional work as a leader in healthcare, that we moved the needle far beyond what anybody said we could because we addressed all three things at once. When you have a system that's ultimately designed around an operational thing, or in the case of healthcare around a physician and their needs, how many places have you been where the closest parking spot is for the doctor? Hmm. For example, you can't just tack an experience fix on top of that system and expect long-term sustainable really customer centric results because it wasn't built around the customer and having been in so many healthcare entities from fortune 50 companies to nonprofit systems the unfortunate truth is sometimes that kind of organizational shift happens better with the influence of somebody external than you can do from inside the organization we just know that that magic middle 
if you're looking at a Venn diagram, right, <laughs> culture right. brand experience, right. that magic middle is exactly what is going to be able to do that for clients. And we're just using our experience to help them narrow in on what it is that needs to be fixed. Much like you, I've had a lot of different facets of my career. And also like mm -hmm. you, I worked in healthcare. I worked uh, in a hospital in Washington, D.C., and I was in charge of their dining and dietary operations and trying to uh, create an experience for people who were either coming off the street who wanted some Starbucks or families who were visiting um, ailing members uh, mm -hmm. of their family and doctors and nurses and professionals. And one of the things that I never thought of all those years ago that I think of constantly now is culture, creating a culture. And as you brought up, um, I think it's easy for us to think about corporate culture in, you know, B2B or SaaS or retail or so, those sorts of industries. But how do you go about thinking about culture if I'm working in a hospital? And how do I go about changing that and defining that and making sure that everybody who works at that hospital is bought into that culture? Mm -hmm. I think fundamentally the kind of culture that providers and caregivers are looking for is based in a foundation of appreciation and gratitude. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it has to be this giant million dollar project that is a new culture with new stickers everywhere and that sort of thing. And I think that's where a lot of healthcare gets it wrong. Of course, there are quality measures. Of course, there are HEDIS and NCQA and Joint Commission things that quality and safety things that they have to address. And often their culture gets built around that, which isn't too far different than a culture in a different segment built around, oh, you need to sell 14 units today or you're out. Right. And so it creates this sense of a cog in a wheel that is super unfulfilling. And I've read a lot of books. There's a terrific book called Compassionomics. It was written by doctors for doctors. And it really was looking at how compassion and empathy in the context of healthcare was the solution for not only better patient and health outcomes, but less burnout among providers. And so this book goes on to present case after case of actual scientific studies with patients and physicians that demonstrate the application of empathy and compassion in that context where they have time to stop and care, which when they get in this cog cycle, they feel like I just have to do all these things on this checklist in the EHR and I don't have time to care about patients. That is the number one disconnect that is showing up in healthcare where providers are feeling more and more administrative press and are losing the reason they got into healthcare. And in some cases, these studies, there was like a five or six second difference in the type of care provided from one group to the other. And it included something like if you were just diagnosed with um, stage four cancer, the addition of the simple phrase by the provider to say, I know this is a lot to take in, but oh, we're wow. here with you. We're going to be with you every step of the way and walk with you. That phrase, which took on average five seconds to deliver, improved the provider feeling about their work it improved the patient outcomes less pain longevity better health outcomes and so i feel like the culture shift needed in healthcare especially right now is got to be less disease and outcome focus and more human focus recognizing that providers are burned out and all the studies i've seen are I just want to be appreciated and thanked for the work I've done. Uh, I love that about culture. And it seems that there's a lot for healthcare executives to learn from yeah. other industries when it goes to creating culture. Yeah. What can those healthcare executives learn from other industries like retail, like travel, when it comes to actual customer engagement? You know, I just came from a recent conference where all of the leaders that we heard in three days of sessions were saying the same sentiment. 
this is a year where they are dialing in on their existing customers, obviously. Um, recession has people a little nervous about spending. Sure. So an organization that is focused in on their existing customers and making their business work better for their staff, who then are the number one brand ambassadors. If people hate their job, that's going to bleed into the customer experience, regardless yeah. of what system or niche or industry you are in. If you hate your job, you're not going to be able to hide it. And so this idea of employee culture and caring for your workforce has been one of the biggest triggers to help make these businesses more profitable. Forrester has said it, McKinsey has said it, all of the big names in their studies have shown this to be the case. Take care of your people, get them to love what they're doing and buy into this idea of, I'm not just a wheel, I am making life better. I have an impact for my end user and that promotes the customer experience and the brand ambassadors from your employees and your customers. Yeah, it seems like there are still organization and, and brands who struggle to invest in those programs in a stronger mm -hmm. customer experience. Why do you think that is? And uh, coming from your experience as a consultant, what do you think they need to do to get in that right mindset and actually enact change? It's a great question. And I think part of the problem is on CX professionals themselves. Um, Forrester did a study earlier this year that showed that more than 60% of customer experience professionals cannot demonstrate ROI. Well, guess what? When a budget cut comes, those are the first That's things that are going to go. <laughs> and they also projected that by 25, 40% of those CX roles would be eliminated because of that fact. And so that is something that we totally focus in on with our clients is if you don't know what is the thumb on the back of your CFO and your COO and your CEO, if you don't have visibility to what keeps them awake at night, you will be marginalized in your organization. If you can't demonstrate how the work you're doing is rising the tide to float all boats, you are at risk. And that is probably the number one thing we see. And also the number one thing that is hindering, I mean, healthcare, obviously their first and primary focus is always quality and safe healthcare, which is reasonable. Sure. Um, but the lack of demonstration and being able to tie this work to the bottom line, like, oh, I did it at a health insurer where I was having a hard time getting some buy-in. And for me, I found out the dollar value of retention of a member, one member. And then I calculated this initiative, which is going to cost us, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars is going to result in $9 million of savings in retained wow. customers. Now you've got the attention you of got the, some CEO, attention, right. the COO. And so for me, I feel like the delay and the problem with really getting buy-in is inability to connect it to what really matters. And money matters. We all have to make money right. to stay in business, but that can't be the center of your choices. The human has to be, and those are the most profitable businesses in some cases by 30% more revenue per year than the ones that ignore the human in the middle. So when you go into an organization, be it a healthcare organization or any other industry with either boss lady or clarity PX, mm -hmm. um, how do you impress upon them that we're going to come in, we're going to do our job, but there's going to come a day when we leave right? and you're left here now to carry it out. Mm -hmm. How do you impress upon them the great importance of like, now you actually have to continue to work on this. Um, is that something that you've seen brands struggle with uh, to continue the work that you've done after you've kind of packed up your bags and gone on to the next brand? It's a really fair question. And I think it's something that 
any consultant needs to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Part of what we do when we work with a client is we do a deep assessment at the beginning. And part of that assessment is the readiness of the organization to adopt these changes they're saying they want. What are their resources? What is their maturity? What is the leadership buy-in? And so we're addressing some of those things that happens where a new leader or a new COO comes in and they're going to, this is their pet thing. And so they set an ad up. And as soon as that person leaves, oh, this new person has this pet project. Right. But I feel like the essential piece is A, obviously identifying where it's going to move the needle long term on the measures that matter. Mm -hmm. And B, weaving that into the cultural shift, which is why we like to work in that experience brand culture space, because if it doesn't become part of the new organizational habits, then it, it has the potential to die out. We're preparing the infrastructure and then training the people along the way, walking with them for a couple months while it launches to make sure they've got it. And that kind of transition makes a difference. If we just provide a, here, go do this, that ends up in an inbox somewhere. I mean, personally, as a leader in healthcare, I've seen hundreds of thousands of dollars spent on consultants that got left on us to implement and it never got used, which is sad. (laughs) That is sad. Let's talk about the voice of the customer and how businesses uh, need to keep up with how the changing landscape of of listening to customers is taking place. Right. So, so many times, you know, we've all had, um, hey, can you take the survey after you get some sort of service done or mm-hmm. you visit a, a retail location or fly an airline or whatever, take the survey. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know how many times you do that. Um, mm-hmm. I usually don't unless it was something that was extraordinary. But those days are sort of waning. And yet it right. seems like there's a lot of uh, heads of business out there who are still a little reticent to catch up to how the customer is being listened to, mm-hmm. specifically in social media is becoming way, way more important now. Yeah. And I think around surveys, particularly, this is where organizational habits run deep (laughs) you know in healthcare for Mm -hmm. instance um press gainy is a popular it's really expensive it's really expensive and they base a lot of their operational decision making on it but it's like three four five six months lagging so there's zero opportunity to fix it in the moment in fact this morning i saw a new study that said the difference between a five star and a four star people like 90% and 93% trust those brands. Mm. When you go from four to three, it drops 60% in trust by the consumer. So for me, I think that those kinds of data points are very compelling. And when we rely on lagging indicators and feedback from surveys, which have been demonstrated in a lot of cases to not truly be what the consumer thinks. To your point, either really great or really mad. Mm-hmm. You know, you'll open those up and fire those off. But yep. most people are like, nah. And for me, I always look at scales like a grading system. Like an A is a five and a one is an F. And three, I don't really care. So yeah. If I don't have an opinion, rather than having an NA button, I'll just mark a three, which on a lot of scales is failing. So it's so subjective how we rate. And I think that the day of we're not going to send surveys is coming where, you know, if you have a call center, that is a goldmine of, you know, preference among your customer. What are they saying? What's important to them? What's their tone? There are a lot of technology platforms, certainly yours included, that have sentiment and, oh, how these words mean they're really upset. So AI is playing a role. Mm -hmm. Yep. Natural language processing, the social media feedback, the online review feedback, all of that. Even even one place that gets missed is what are your frontline people hearing? And I've had CEOs in the past who are like, no, I won't listen to that. That's anecdotal. And I'm like, 
This is their actual words of your customer in their passion. Yeah. In their passion, in their own words, this is what they are saying. And they refused it unless it was the formal survey. And so for me, I think it's incumbent on leaders everywhere to aggregate all of that feedback. And there is so much feedback that organizations get that they aren't using. And I think that closer and closer to the customer is the future of how um, CX and voice of the customer is going to operate. That survey thing, I'm not a fan, (laughs) but (laughs) they have a place, but they're so antiquated and so far behind. You don't have that opportunity to fix your issue which might mean you go from a four to a three star and you've now lost 60% of your brand trust. That's devastating. Mind bending. Wow. Uh, yeah. You know, you're talking about leaders and, uh, and one of the things that I have admired about you is that you lead by example, you walk the talk. Like um, for instance, the way that you've built your agency's core mm-hmm. values. And I, I'm hoping that you can speak to those core values. What are they? How have you built them? And then how do you sustain those core values over time? Yeah. Love that. Um, In fact, I just hired um, two new people on the team and every person I interviewed without exception, the thing that drew them to our agency was our core values. So I'm very proud of them. (laughs) We have three. That's great. One is that honesty is non-negotiable. So for us, good, bad, ugly. It's all part of the lesson and the learning. And so we've created a culture of safety where if you don't agree, if there's a problem, if I screwed up, all of that is fair and it's not punitive. And I think that is a place that breeds innovation. It breeds commitment to doing things better and it breeds engagement because they're not like quite, you know, I had a manager come to me once and go, I know our monthly reports are due and this data point for this client doesn't look good this month. Should I leave it off? I'm like, no, yeah, no, hundred percent not. We are transparent. <laughs> we're going to be honest about it and we're going to tell you what we're going to do about it. And so honesty is non-negotiable. One of our other core values is that human kindness is what matters most. Humans matter more than KPIs. We have a little sign, humans greater than KPIs, both for our team, but also for our clients. And then our third core value is that health is an intentional priority. And I mean that in every sense of the word, physical, mental, spiritual, emotional. We have got to prioritize health. And I am been there, done that, burned out, have the scars to show for it. Right. Just doing more, longer, harder is not the path to success. The new generations of workers are over it. They want balance. They don't want to be on call 24 seven. So we practice what we preach in maintaining a balance. If somebody needs a break, you know, on our Slack channel, we're like, ah, I'm fried. I gotta go walk the dog. We have one client that This is their third year with us. First year, doubled their revenue. Second year, doubled that revenue. This year, that's their goal, double it again. So they're going to be time six in three years, which is exciting. And we love the work we do for them. We're all in committed, but with a boundary. So. Oh, I love that. All in committed, but with a boundary. Yeah. I think that's great and healthy. And when you're talking about attracting talent, Right. That is huge. And I think there can be a lingering mentality of, hey, if I'm giving you a paycheck, you belong to me every (laughs) every uh, minute and hour of the day. And I love that you're setting the example of saying, no, that that doesn't work for us. It's not how we do business. No, it Um, doesn't. And it's important that we don't treat humans as disposable. And, and there's some businesses that get that really right. And others that are not doing well at that. Can you talk about supplying your employees with the right tools to do great work, specifically in the realm of customer experience? Um, Do you often find that the employees have not been either empowered 
to do the work for the customer and or they're just not given the right tools uh, to provide that experience? And if so, what is your recommendation to those organizations? I think it's both and, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. you know, often in organizations that like, I think of the people who check in a patient at a healthcare center, for instance, mm -hmm. they have a job, they've got a routine, they got to do this thing and they get super, you know, myopic on their one deliverable. And that to me is always a symptom of a lack of human centered culture. Mm -hmm. So it hasn't woven into the work of everybody for the landscaper to know that the work he does outside the hospital is helping maybe just put a smile on someone's face who's going through one of the hardest moments of their life. You know, for the dietary team to understand that this warm cookie right out of the oven is as close to a hug as you can give to somebody when their yep. child's sitting in surgery and they are freaking out. And so there's ways, I think, again, it comes back to that culture and the human centricity of the leadership buy-in from the top down. And there are all also some tool issues. It kind of depends on where you're at. So for us, we really try to make sure they're A, tied to the customer impact that every individual, whether you're a call center rep or a pilot, <laughs> mm. needs to know that they matter in the bigger picture and how are they influencing the bottom line and making the experience better for another human. I think that that is in and of itself the most motivating thing. Sometimes that's a tech solution to have more visibility. Sometimes that's information. Sometimes it's training, sometimes it's culture. Sally, I wanted to circle back on a book that you mentioned. I think it was called Compassionomics. Can you talk a little bit more about that book? Sure, sure. It's Compassionomics by Stephen Treziak. Here, I'll show you. I got it. Oh, there it is. Um, it's the revolutionary scientific evidence that caring makes a difference. And it's actually based in real scientific studies and case studies with clients and doctors. And so if you're in a healthcare position, particularly a lot of doctors are very left brained. Sure. So this is scientific proof that shows that this kind of shift to empathy and compassion and human centricity makes a difference in the outcomes in medicine. So it's a really great case study for you if you're in any kind of caring field to help just get another little tool in your bag to help bring people along into buy-in of why these kinds of shifts make good business sense. Wow. I feel like at least every medical professional should have that on their bedside mm -hmm. table um, because I, I know that lots of us have had less than optimal experiences in healthcare, certainly. And yeah. compassion does seem to be the thing that is missing. And I like that compassion is tied into economics in this really good wordplay. Mm -hmm. So there is ROI on compassion. And I'm mm -hmm. imagining that the book uh, speaks to that. I can't wait to check it out myself. Um, yeah. As our listeners know at CXWise, we like the learning to continue and we like to give away stuff for free. So uh, if there's a key takeaway that you found particularly exciting or relevant that you want to share on your social media platform of choice, uh, use the hashtag CXWise. Uh, let us know what that key takeaway is from this episode of uh, Sally, and we will uh, send you Compassionomics on us. So thank you very much for the recommendation, Sally. So yeah. we're almost at the end of our time, and this is a question that's been burning um, in my mind and soul ever since I found something out about you. Here it goes. What has raising goats taught you about customer experience? <laughs> I love this I, question. I'm dying to know. So as a city girl, we got our five acre farm, the dream, got four Nigerian dwarf goats, and I knew nothing about it. And it was a lot of work. First of all, the first lesson I learned was 
you can't do it on your own. You need a mentor and somebody who can pave the road. I had a goat farmer who we bought our goats from. She let me come intern for free on three weekends and I got to see the whole thing, giving shots, trimming hooves, what to do with their horns, all the care for these customers of mine, I learned from the mentor. And so had I just taken goats home, I would have never known how to manage their care. I needed her insight. The second lesson I really learned was that misbehavior or outbursts, goats are notorious <laughs> for getting out, for climbing, for chewing, for whatever, were really symptoms of poor health or mm. a need unmet. And so in customer experience, we get so offended at the negative review or the negative feedback or the complainer on the staff. But really, those are symptoms of an unmet need. And when you can see beyond the emotional reaction to what's going on deeper here and what is it that I can do to help meet the need so that they don't have to create a drama or a chaos, um, you, you will have a healthier and happier <laughs> and more secure and a more content customer base, <laughs> my goats. So those are your the two goats. primary lessons that I learned. Uh, Sally Mildren, thank you so much for your time. Uh, this has been really, really impactful to me personally. I know it will be to our audience as well. Thank you so much for making us just a little bit CX wiser. Thank you, You're Sally. Well, thank you.